Hello, this is Mark Davidson. I'm the manager of marketing and technical materials for Canfill USA. And today we'd like to talk a little bit about the coronavirus situation. This is a very fluid situation. There's a lot of information uh, being passed around on the, uh, not just the internet, but on the news and the newspapers. And I think it's probably worthwhile for us to uh, get some expert information from someone who's been involved in uh, virus uh, filtration for a long time. So what we wanted to do is go right to the source of someone who's been involved with work like this before. So I'd like to introduce you to um, Steve Devine. Steve is the Vice President of Research and Development for Canfill USA. So Steve, take a few moments, if you would introduce us to yourself and then maybe touch a little bit on your background, maybe as it relates to um, uh, virus, work with viruses and things like that. Yes, thank you very much, Mark. My name is Steve Devine. I am Vice President, Research and Development for Camphill USA. I'm located in uh, the Camphill headquarters in Riverdale, New Jersey. I've been with Camphill since 1993. And recently, over the past decade, I've worked uh, quite a bit on filtration and specifically filtration of virus and uh, droplet nuclei containing virus to protect swine from disease, from viral disease. Thanks, Steve. Now, I've uh, put together some notes that I, that I think would be helpful, that maybe we could kind of use you as a background and a source to go through and, and explain to everyone. I guess the very first question, natural question, is just what exactly is coronavirus? What are we talking about here? Yeah, coronavirus and it is really a class of viruses, and we're familiar with different types of viruses, but coronavirus was uh, named in 1964 when it was first imaged uh, using uh, electron microscopy. And it, it's called corona because corona means crown in Latin. And, and what we noticed with the electron micrograph was that there was this crown shape around the outside of the virus. So it's an enveloped virus. There's a protein sheath around it. And there are these protein spikes that stick out that resemble a crown. So that's why it's called a coronavirus. So it's not really new. It's been around probably for millions of years, different types of coronaviruses. But what's new about this one, and the reason why it's called a, a novo or novel uh, or novel coronavirus is because it's new to the human population. It recently made the zoonotic jump from animal, from an animal reservoir uh, to humans in Woshan, China. So we, I think we all have heard about that part of the story. Right. And the reason we're so concerned about coronavirus or this coronavirus is because being novel, being new, nobody on earth has immunity to it. So with influenza A, uh, there's been uh, different types of flu going around year on year. Many people have some immunity to, to certain types of flu. With this one, only those 110 people or 105,000 people that have confirmed cases, those are the only people, those survivors, who have immunity in the world today. Okay, so I've, I've so I seems like I've heard the phrase coronavirus as it relates to SARS or MERS or some of these other ones. Are, are this, is this another version of that, or is it totally separate, or what? How does that work? Yeah, you're exactly correct. Uh, you know, we've heard two terms and they get mixed up quite a bit. So the first one is SARS-CoV-2, and that's the virus that this is. This, that is the strain and the type of virus that this is. So it is a SARS virus. And SARS is an acronym. It means Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. So from that, we, we know that this coronavirus is producing respiratory symptoms in individuals. The other thing that we hear a lot about is something called COVID-19. And COVID-19 is the respiratory syndrome that this virus produces. So when people get ill, they are diagnosed with COVID-19 if, if they become infected with this particular virus. Okay, all right, that's helpful. So then here's another question. You were talking, you've been talking about viruses. And, and I think a lot of people have a vague understanding that viruses are much smaller than bacteria. But then sometimes you know that some things are so big or so small, it's really hard to grasp that size of something that is so small that it's beyond what we're typically used to. So how big is a virus? Yeah, so that's a good question. The very simple viruses are as small as 20 nanometers. 
uh, which is 0 0.02 micron. It's very, very small. The largest ones are, let's say, 400 nanometers or so. This virus is a pretty complex one. It is enveloped. It does have the protein spikes. So its aerodynamic diameter, if you will, is about 160 nanometers or 0.16 micron. But the thing that we have to realize is, uh, you know, that is quite small. A, a human hair is about 50, 55 micron in diameter, typical. So this is one three hundredth the size of a human hair. And you, you might think, wow, that's going to be really hard to filter. But the fact is, is that viruses do not fly around uh, individually on their own. They're associated with droplet nuclei. These droplets are expelled or exhaled when an infected individual coughs or sneezes. So these droplets we know range in size from about 0.5 micron, which is one-tenth the size of a human hair, to, or one one-hundredth the size of a human hair, up to, uh, let's say, about 16 micron. Uh, so that's the, I'm sorry, that's the, the droplets that's you're the, talking about. Okay. All right, gotcha. Okay, so, so what we really when a sick person is, sneezes, they're not, yes. they're not ejecting 100 million viruses, they're ejecting respiratory droplets that you're talking about, right? Right, and so if we were, if we were for instance, to assume uh, a viral concentration in the respiratory droplet of, let's say, 32 parts per million, and I pick that number because it appears in the literature uh, you know, somewhat with some frequency, so okay. about 32 parts per million of virus in that droplet, uh, it would take a four micron diameter droplet to contain one virus, theoretically, based on the volume. Uh, a 10 micron droplet would contain about 18 viruses on average. And if so we get do down you have to any way to know how many droplets are expelled in an average cough or sneeze? That, yeah, obviously there can be thousands and thousands okay. of okay. drops in that aerosol. So okay. that, that's where the numbers become overwhelming and that's where air filtration comes in to reduce the number of droplets that are airborne and uh, you know, the quantity and reduce the amount of time that they persist in there. So we want to okay. clean them up. Okay, so these droplets then, if they contain virus and viruses and um, they're made of uh, a cough or a respiratory, I'm, I'm sure this, we don't want to get too gross here, but I'm, I'm sure you've seen this, people cough or sneeze, and you can physically see that expel, and you can also see it, it goes out and it drops down. It just doesn't shoot, you know, 500 feet across an empty area. So these things have weight, and they settle out then, right? And they settle on yes. the ground? Is that what happens? Right, exactly. So we, we know from Stokes' law, which is a terminal velocity equation, a force balance equation between gravity and the uh, viscosity resistance of a droplet or a particle in air. We know from Stokes' law that uh, if I go back to that two and a half micron size particle, which we would consider being about the minimum infectious uh, size uh, droplet, that could persist in the air, uh, discharged from the height of five feet, let's say a person standing up uh, roughly okay. about five feet high, uh, that could persist in the air for over 110 uh, minutes. That's quite a long time, more, well over an hour and a half. 110 the, minutes. Yes. It's and, just going to hang. It, right. so then somebody's in a hospital room that could potentially just hang right there. That, that, could, that could still be airborne for more than an hour, well over an hour. The uh, larger size droplets that we're concerned about, maybe let's say 10 micron, can hover in the air for just about seven minutes, just under seven minutes. So that's seven still quite is, yeah, that's a long, so, the, and so as you were saying, the 10 micron droplet has, theoretically would have a uh, um, far higher number of potentially live viruses, even for seven minutes, is what right. you're saying. Okay. So we can consider the velocity that uh, droplets are expelled from an individual and how far they'll travel horizontally. And we think that uh, if you stay about six feet or two meters away from an infected person, uh, even if they do cough or sneeze, they probably will not eject uh, droplets that will impact you yourself, and particularly not in your eyes or your nose, your mouth, which would be the most infectious route. So okay. we know that the primary route of transition, uh, transmission is airborne, and it's with these respiratory droplets being directly inhaled or uh, depositing on our face uh, where it transfers to our eyes or nose or mouth. 
So okay. this is the first thing we, we should be concerned about is distancing ourselves at least by six feet from someone who's known to be infected. Um, okay. So that, that's one thing. The second thing that can happen is these droplets do fall out of the air, they land on surfaces, and then they can be picked up. So if we touch that surface and it's still moist, uh, we can then touch our face or our eyes, which I'm really trying to avoid doing these days, and uh, we can infect ourselves through that secondary route. Okay. Now, I, I assume, because I've read and seen some other things, that there are exceptions to every rule. And even in those cases where you're talking that things are, are heavy enough and they drop out, um, my guess is there are some cases where maybe for lack of a better phrase, the virus breaks away or the nuclei is much smaller, the droplet, and it expels even further, and there's the potential for it to get caught up in the return air duct in a, uh, in a room and get carried up into the ventilation system. I would assume yeah. that that's possible because that does happen. And understand measles, that's, that's a common thing that happens in measles. So could that Absolutely. happen here with this as well? Absolutely, and that's what, uh, air, why good air filtration is important. Uh, not only that we have fresh air entering the room, clean air, but we're also capturing the air that's in the room and bringing it to the air filter and cleaning out the droplets and the virus that, that might still be in the air. So that 110 minutes for that two and a half micron particle or the seven minutes for the 10 micron, if we can clean the air of the room and move that air into a, a filtration bank, uh, we reduce the amount of time uh, that an event is significant. So let's say an infected person is in the room, they cough or sneeze, you enter the room 15 or 20 minutes later, it would certainly be much better to have fresh air cleaning out that room yeah. in the meantime. And that, that's yeah, why, yeah, air, yeah, that's the role air filtration plays, is to reduce the likelihood and the risk of acquiring an infection when an infected person was previously in that space. Okay, now, so let's then take this then. So somebody is in a room, hypothetical, someone is in a, a hospital room, they, they cough or sneeze, those, those particles are in the air, the smaller ones are even a little bit further away, and as you said, they're hanging for a longer period of time. They get caught in the return air duct, they're carried into a filter. So then that begs the question, what type of filter? So when you say filter, uh, I know filters are rated just like we rate everything, so what rating uh, would a filter need to be so that I, on the other side of that room where the supply is going to come out, would have a reasonable risk that my health is protected? What would I need to use? Right. So we, we can use this, uh, a, a high efficiency filter, but through the research that CAMFL has done with uh, University of Minnesota on swine disease and swine disease eradication, uh, we know that a MERV 15 filter and above higher would be sufficient and adequate to um, capture enough droplet nuclei, uh, at least in the viruses that we've studied, uh, not, not this particular coronavirus, but it probably behaves very similar and that we can filter out those droplets and prevent infection. So we, CAMFA would recommend a MERV 15 and above. Now, if it's a critical application, uh, maybe it's an isolation room or it's a biosafety laboratory or a cabinet or something like that where known virus is being handled, uh, then of course we want to go to HEPA filtration. Okay. But for the general spaces, MERV 15 and above, uh, according to ASHRAE standard 52.2 um, would be adequate. And when we say MERV 15, we also mean MERV 15A. So it has okay. to maintain that MERV 15 efficiency during its lifetime. Okay, um, all right. It, for our international listeners, uh, that would be an ISO uh, 16890, PM1 or EPM1, 80% or higher. Okay. All right. So I'm in a, in a small office environment here. Um, could I go out, purchase a MERV 15 filter, install it in the existing HVAC system? Is that something that uh, a reasonable person can, can accomplish? You know, in a commercial setting or an industrial setting, that's probably possible. Uh, these filters are usually about 12 inches deep. They're a little less than that, and they, they have a header frame, typically. Uh, general HVAC systems are not usually uh, fitted to accept or to uh, work well with HEPA filters, so that would have to be, uh, you know, something that was already done and we prepared for. Uh, in the home environment or in a home office environment, that's probably not likely. Most okay. 
own uh, HVAC systems uh, have a one inch or a two inch track. They have very little space in the, in the cabinet that holds the filter and the typical MERV 15 filter would not fit in that application. Okay, that's, so, that's what I have. So what, yeah. what would, and I assume that's probably what a lot of people have that are in smaller environments and offices and things like that. So if that's the case, what, because if I'm in a big commercial office building and I have an office, three doors down, somebody may be sick, uh, what can I do to add a little bit of uh, comfort to my uh, air quality? What can I do? if I can't put that in my HVAC. Right, to improve air quality in your workspace, the best thing to do in that case would be to use a standalone ductless uh, type air cleaner of good okay. quality, one that uh, is capable of MERV 15 or uh, EPM 180% or higher efficiency. Uh, a number of companies sell those and they, they are available. Although I would imagine uh, these days they're becoming uh, even of short supply. Yeah, I would. I would imagine that's the case. Okay, so if we kind of go back and sum this all up, coronavirus is a, uh, a virus, a family of viruses that have been around for a while. Um, they are typically transmitted right now by, by either touch or by these expelled respiratory droplets. And you have a pretty good idea based upon your experience working in a, in a lot of different environments that a MERV 15 filter at a minimum, and that's a minimum, you can always go higher, but from a minimum point of view, a MERV 15 filter, you have a pretty high confidence that that's gonna capture the uh, a very high level. You're, I believe you're talking 99% plus of those uh, particles, right? Yes, that, that's okay. correct. The, the thing that the filter cannot stop is a situation where we are within the uh, contagious zone of a, an, a known infected individual, and they cough or sneeze and we, we catch that right in the face. Uh, of right. course, in that case, it's too late. It's just too late for the filter. The other great thing you can do, aside from improving your indoor air quality, is to wash your hands compulsively. Right, Quite compulsively. I, uh, I think we're all washing our hands a couple of dozen times a day uh, these days. Yeah, I think that's true. In addition to the small um, individual room purifiers being sold, I would imagine that uh, hand sanitizer sales are through the roof so yeah I, I you know the hand sanitizer is great if you have no uh no other uh, choice um but a good old bar of soap and soap and water and wash for 20 seconds that's the best way to okay and, great uh, so a lot less expensive way yeah a lot, yeah, a lot less expensive so so I, I i appreciate that i think we've come up with a uh, a pretty good plan what to do if you've got some concerns you should explore the idea about a MERV 15 filter. If you need professional help, seek out a qualified and uh, a well-known filtration company um, that can help install that. Otherwise, take a look at these individual room air purifiers, ductless filters that would um, potentially reduce that contamination level. As you said, you, you can get into a case where those particles can remain suspended for 110 minutes. So everybody needs to take a few steps to clean that air. Uh, absolutely. Okay, thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. That's a lot of good information. I, and I know you from the past, I know you've done a lot of work in that swine area and it's been very, very effective. And so it's nice that all of that work from the past is certainly coming into play here. Okay, thank well, you everyone for watching. Mark. We appreciate your time. Thanks again, Steve. Thank you. Be well.